please make your way back to your seat. Thank you. Make a loud noise. We're about to begin the next panel. Please make your way to your seats. Thank you. Thank you, Kirsten. It's gonna like do a bigger thing. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so as we begin this morning um, for this next panel, I, I wanted to just take a moment to recognize the place that we're gathered. Um, as you may have seen when you came into the building today, we are near the White River, um, which is in the Connecticut River Valley here in the Upper Valley between uh, Vermont and New Hampshire. This is part of the homeland of the Abenaki people, which they refer to as Nakina, which means our land. This homeland uh, historically extended across most of northern New England and southern Quebec. Um, today, there are about 3,200 Abenaki living in Vermont and New Hampshire without reservations, um, and they only recently received recognition from the state of Vermont um, in the last seven years. The name Abenaki was derived from the term meaning light and land, which means the people of the rising sun or the people of the east. So I just wanna recognize them as we sit here today in this building. Um, for indigenous cultures around the world, recognizing the rights of nature is not something new. It's simply consistent with the traditions um, of living in harmony with nature. Indigenous people do not see nature as property. All life, including human life, are deeply connected. Decisions and values are based on what is good for the whole, including humans and nature. Um, so I'd like to introduce myself and then I'll welcome our panelists who are gonna speak this morning. Um, my name is Rachel Stevens and I'm a staff attorney at the Environmental and Natural Resources Law Clinic here at Vermont Law School. We're a, a nonprofit environmental law clinic that provides free legal services to communities that suffer disproportionate impacts from environmental harms. Um, and because of that mission, many of our cases um, represent environmental justice communities and we've worked with several indigenous tribes on past cases. Um, a few of those, just by way of an example, um, we represented several members of the Passamaquoddy tribe in Maine that were challenging um, the Bureau of Indian Affairs. Uh, they made a decision to place a liquefied natural gas facility on tribal lands, um, and we um, did a lawsuit against um, the agency for that. We've also represented the White Earth Nation, which is a, um, a tribal group in Minnesota that was challenging um, a pipeline from Alberta, Canada through their tribal lands. Um, and one of the things that becomes really apparent when you work on a case like this is to realize the limitations of our existing environmental statutes. Um, you know, these tribes were able to have standing as plaintiffs in these cases. Um, we were successful in some ways and not in others. Um, and a lot of that is just because of the um, the disagreement about what, what it means to protect these places and, and the value they have in our society. Um, so just turning our attention to our first panelist, um, here we have Kirsten Anker. She teaches property, um, legal theory, and Aboriginal law and indigenous legal um, traditions. Her book, Declarations of Independence, a legal pluralist approach to indigenous rights, explores various aspects of claiming native Aboriginal title as a way to inspire a reimagination of law. She has written widely on the challenge to orthodox understandings of law and sovereignty posed by the recognition in Australia and Canada that indigenous law, quote, intersects or coexists with state law and draws on studies in legal theory, anthropology, indigenous and occidental philosophy, translation and language. Current projects include work on indigenous legal traditions and formal legal education, non-static digital mapping and land claims, the privatization of indigenous consultation and ecological jurisprudence. So please welcome Kirsten. Hi, thank you for that welcome. I'm really happy to be here on Womanagiak, the land of the dawn. I recognize the, the key phoneme in the Aki, which is a, a a word land that is shared with other Algonquian language speaking groups, um, Ischi in Northern Cree, um, Aski, uh, Aki. Um, 
I'm grateful to all the organizers of the conference, so the, the symposium, to all of you for being here, uh, for all the others who make this possible in kind of other ways, such as the janitors who clean up after us and the people who provide catering. Um, and to sort of extend this theme of gratitude, I, I also want to spend a, a little moment just feeling where we are and feeling what's around us, and maybe you have some food in your stomach, and I invite you to think about where that food has come from and the, the gifts that have been made to make that happen. So the plants and the animals that have given these gifts to us, if you're touching your iPhone or other kind of uh, factory made things and perhaps think about the, the humans that have helped make those things, the minerals that have been dug out of the earth that belongs to somebody, uh, the plastics that used to be animals and plants a long time ago. Um, and. I could go on, but I'm going to stop there. Um, so I don't know if you recognize that uh, protocol is, is sort of my very adapted version of a Haudenosaunee or Iroquois uh, protocol by which any meeting like this is, is begun. So the Haudenosaunee have territory that, that extends through the Great Lakes and, and up into Montreal. So they're very present where I come from Montreal. Well, I live in Montreal now. You can probably hear from my accent that I'm originally from Australia. Um, so so I, uh, I have learned this uh, protocol, it's called the Ohundagariwa Dekwa, so it's the words that uh, literally means the words before everything else, but it's colloquially known as the Thanksgiving Address. And so I wanted to start with that, um, both as a sort of gesture to the legal protocols of the place where I live, but also a, a point that I'll come back to, which is about a kind of mindful practice, so I'm going to end up there later in, in what I'm saying. So I was asked to speak on the rights of nature in Indigenous environmental governance in Canada. I'll just ask my glass of water. Um, so just to say that I consider myself a student of Indigenous perspectives. I am not Indigenous myself. As I mentioned, I come from Australia and I have been in, in Canada for about 13 or 14 years. I'm what the Gitsan on the West Coast call one of the visitors who never left. Um, but as a citizen now of Canada, I uh, am in a, a treaty relationship with Indigenous peoples and that treaty has sources in Indigenous law, so those uh, those Indigenous perspectives are legally relevant to me, and uh, I have an obligation, I think, to understand what they are. So uh, that's the approach that I'm bringing to you: is, is as a non-Indigenous and outsider who, nonetheless, is invited into participating in relationships that are structured by Indigenous law. So the topic of the rights of nature is not, it's kind of, kind of obvious to approach in Canada. It hasn't really been taken up as a kind of catchphrase per se. <clears throat> a study in 1996 of, of uh, forest values uh, posed some questions around asking people to respond to the statements, forests have a right to exist, wildlife, plants, and humans have equal rights to live and develop, and, and it just wasn't, it didn't register with people. <clears> that <throat> might have been changing a little bit. Certainly the David Suzuki Foundation has been involved with the, the Rights of Mother Earth <clears throat> movement, and there's been a, a book published recently last year by David Boyd on the rights of nature, but <clears throat> generally it hasn't really been um, picked up that much. Um, I think if, if, so if we had to look at sort of technically or in terms of the, the legal tools that rights of nature represent, uh, standing has been mentioned as one kind of very practical way that rights of nature can affect the kinds of claims that we can make. There has been a kind of element uh, in which um, the doctrine of parents patriae, so the idea that the, that the state is the um, sort of parent of the, of, the st of the state of the society, excuse me, <clears throat> has been raised in a few cases to do with environmental protection, but it, it really does come back to protecting the environmental value, that the environment as it is valued by human actors. So, um, of course, at a more general level, with some of the broader concepts that the rights of nature involve, such as personhood for non-human entities, of course, and this has been raised a number of times already, there's a, a great resonance with indigenous cosmologies and ways of life and, and, and life worlds. Um, so, um, 
you know, ideas of uh, being in a kinship relationship is was mentioned in the Maori context in New Zealand. It also has a lot of resonance in Canada. Uh, for example, let me give you some specific texts. So the um, Chippewas of the Thames First Nation have a draft constitution in which they included uh, one of their provisions is that every member of the Chippewa of the Thames First Nation is equal before the laws without discrimination or prejudice, including the fish. Now, I don't know why they just mentioned the fish, but this was a draft constitution. Uh, my colleague John Burroughs, who's an Anishinaabe scholar, a very uh, preeminent, uh, uh, well-respected indigenous scholar, um, you know, gave them feedback on that. He, he passed it on to me. Uh, he said, you know, that this really does resonate with uh, Anishinaabe traditions uh, of regarding all living beings as worthy of respect, honor, and dignity. But he su suggested that they might want to extend it to animals, insects, plants, and, and rocks, and so on. So this is kind of a common framing. You know, everything is alive and has spirit. There's an address in Anishinaabe, all my relations. Uh, and that includes, of course, non-human relations. Um, so, and what might be uh, often one sort of uh, example of this is that it's not just sort of obviously animate things such as, as animals that are considered to be kin and to, to have to be actors and to have personhood, but also things like rocks and, and even kettles. Uh, so personhood in some ways is, I mean, we've talked about rights of nature as a, as a tool, as a useful tool to achieve an objective, but I think this goes beyond thinking of it as a tool. Personhood is actually being kind of taken literally here. So uh, Paul Nadasdi, an anthropologist, has written about uh, Dene hunting in the north as, um, as a, a kind of social gift exchange relationship. So the understanding is not that humans kind of exercise their skill to hunt down the animal and then they capture and possess it. And anyone who studied property law will know about the law of possession starts with, <laughs> with uh, Pearson and Post and so on. You know, these, these hunting cases provide the, the, the sort of first year fodder of, of law schools for, for property. Um, but it's seen as being uh, a long standing social relationship with these animals that humans have certain obligations to fulfill, such as doing certain ceremonies and providing gifts in exchange, leaving tobacco when you, when you, uh, when you make the, the hunt, take from the hunt, and uh, treating the animal with respect, not leaving the bones, and you know, using all parts of the animals, uh, making sure that, that you're not hunting uh, mothers with young, like all, all the kind of you know, things that we can more readily recognize as, as kind of resource management. But uh, underlying it is this idea that, that animals are not being hunted, they're giving, they're choosing, they're exercising their agency to give themselves to you as a gift. Um, and, so, and so that also extends to things like rocks, which, you know, if you're going to use a rock for something, then there are ceremonies. Uh, and I'm being, by the way, extremely generic at the moment, of course, we can talk about individual nations and languages and, and the way they uh, approach this, but, um, you know, an example given that even to use rocks, there would be a certain ceremony uh, to ask legal legal permissions for that. Um, and just as a side note, I guess I spoke about perhaps being cautious about being generic, but um, the, the idea that animacy is even represented, so often the idea uh, is, is raised that uh, in, let's say, Cree or Anishinaabe languages, rocks, for example, uh, belong to the animate category. So there's like two basic categories for nouns, animate and inanimate. Uh, and, and so we have things that would, in English we wouldn't consider to be animate belong in that category. But it, it's much more complex than that because there are some things that, so for example, um, in, in Cree, uh, the moon, the stars, kettle, stones, and the sun are animate, but uh, body parts, rivers, and land are inanimate. So the, this phrase, Mother Earth, which is sort of come to stand in for this idea that, that everything is alive and the earth is our mother and sort of personifying the earth. Uh, this one writer I looked at uh, said, no, it, grammatically that doesn't make sense because mother is a person and land is, uh, it, mother is animate and land is inanimate. And it, it might make sense as kind of a modern adaptation, but it doesn't make sense grammatically. So I just wanted to complexify the, the, <laughs> the grammat grammatical aspects there. Um, but in any case, certainly the idea of non-human things having personhood does resonate. Um, we've, we've already had this discussion about the focus on responsibilities and obligations rather than rights, and I think that is probably the focus that most uh, indigenous groups that I'm aware of would, would um, 
would want to dwell on, a suggestion from Beth Biotot, who's a, a NAPERS scholar, uh, says that perhaps you might even want to think about the relationship as having the rights rather than the entity. Um, and this might give what seem counterintuitive approaches. So just to give you an example, there was a conflict with some Innu groups in sort of the north side of the St. Laurent River um, where news was coming in that the caribou populations were declining and the conservations of conservationists, of course, wanted to stop any hunting. And the, the response from the Innu was, no, we have uh, abandoned our traditional responsibility. We have disrespected the caribou by not hunting them. We need to now pursue the hunt because for them, that was the, like hunting the caribou was a key part of the relationship and they had abandoned that relationship and so the caribou were kind of punishing them by, by disappearing. Um, another example which is, can even be sort of uh, damaging for the humans, uh, uh, Liz Hoover has written about Aquasasne, which is a Mohawk community on the border between Canada and, uh, and the US and uh, some of the elders uh, so they knew about the contamination of the fish from the heavy industry around there, the PCBs that were entering into the, the food chain. Um, and they, they're, they're sort of, I don't know, the paradox or the contradiction they were faced with or the, the dilemma they were faced with, their traditional relationship with the fish that I sort of mentioned in this opening address uh, requires them to continue practicing respectful consumption, that, 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 that they were bound in this, that, that bound in an obligation to, to continue that, that practice. So, um, so it's not, there's not kind of a facile or easy adapt, you know, sort of adoption of you know, they the can sound like cliches, Mother Earth, everything living in harmony, you know, but it, get, it gets more complex when you kind of look at what the particulars of these legal orders are, these constitutional orders that impose particular obligations. Um, so I just want to finish by giving a brief uh, set of examples where these kind of things have been put into practice. Um, and I guess there's a couple of areas where state law, you know, state as in nation state law, um, gives space to, to these practices within Canadian law. So. First of all, we have the reserve system. There's very limited governance uh, capacity that, that um, band councils have under the Indian Act. Uh, for example, for preservation, protection, and management of fur-bearing animals, game, and fish, and for consenting to granting timber licenses. So there might be a way to sort of bring these kind of um, principles to bear on reserves. First Nations have also entered into land claim agreements and self-government agreements that on they usually divide up the traditional territory into say a small percentage in which they have kind of fairly extensive uh, jurisdiction, but for kind of environmental issues, it tends to be um, it tends to be uh, concurrent jurisdiction. So as long as they meet and exceed provincial standards, for instance, for forestries, their laws can apply. And um, Zoe Todd gives an interesting example of. I lost my other page. To remember, uh, she talks about an interesting example in an, in an Inuit uh, community where there are two licensing processes. So, if you want to go fishing, for instance, you'll have to go to the Northwest Territories um, uh, licensing and you know pay the fee or whatever. And there is a kind of bureaucratic uh, process also for the Hunters and Trapper Association because um, one of the concerns about any of these kind of co-management or, or uh, overlapping processes is that there's a kind of juggernaut of bureaucratic. Um, technocratic uh, sort of way of thinking that any kind of traditional knowledge just ends up getting kind of filtered into that, that way of, so you know, even if you do have kind of equal representation, um, the decision making process ends up getting dominated by scientific knowledge and traditional knowledge just ends up, you know, what can we mine for kind of information? But she, she talks about the way that even through this bureaucratic process, by simply requiring people to, okay, you can limit the numbers of fish, but even uh, uh, requiring particular kinds of practices, like you must not do this with the bones of the fish, kind of forces people to think about human-fish relationships in, in a particular way. Um, so I, I'm terrible with conclusions. I generally don't like them. But uh, uh, one, of Zoe, one of Zoe Todd's uh, points in that piece where she talks about human-fish relationships as kind of an active engagement, something that you need to do in order to, so it, it, it's kind of, there's, there is an epistemological angle to it where it's about a knowledge system, you have to try and understand things in a particular way, but there's also a political practice that you don't really get until you do it. So um, 
this is why I wanted to, I'm going to come back to my starting point, why I think things like ceremonies and telling stories about things and noticing the relationships that we have, even though we might, they're invisible to us when we pick up our phone or we sit on a seat or we eat food from somewhere. We don't even think about where they come from and the, and the relationships that we're embedded in in, in, in all these practices. Uh, and so that for me is why that's kind of one place where we can start, regardless of all these the structures that may or may not exist to, to fit things in in a kind of a formal legal sense, but there's a practice that we can um, kind of pick up in our everyday life to make it not just a tool, but a way of living. Thank you. Thank you, Kirsten. Um, our next speaker is Dion Ben. Dion Ben is originally from the community of Tohachi, New Mexico, and is a member of the Navajo Nation. He works for the Grand Canyon Trust's Native America program. The Grand Canyon Trust is grounded in that place, working tirelessly since 1985 to protect the air, water, and wildlife of its slick rock canyons, fragile deserts, and forested mesas. Um, growing up on Navajo land, Dion experienced the perfect mesh of traditional knowledge and environmental education, which led him to his graduate work focusing on incorporating traditional ecological knowledge to address animal husbandry and grazing within tribal communities that are facing climate challenges. Please join me in welcoming Dion. Hello, everybody. Good afternoon. I was just going to comment and say I don't think you're good at conclusions because it's not really a native thing to conclude anything. Everything continues in cycles, so That's why I don't like that. make you feel a little better about working on conclusions. Um, I wanted to first thank Margaret and Hannah for inviting me out and for putting this event on and putting it together because I think there are some really key themes that are being discussed here that I haven't um, considered myself in the arena of rights of nature and uh, environmental law and policy and moving forward as a nation and initiatives. So uh, thank you for putting this together and for bringing me out. The accommodations have been so tremendously um, well put together and the landscape out here this is my first time visiting New England so the landscape here is such a beautiful place and the people here are so nice as well so college students that are here at the college uh, that are not from here you're very fortunate to be here in this area so thank you um, I'm gonna first introduce myself in Navajo um, as it's custom for us to introduce ourselves so that the place knows where we come from and here's our language and can connect us back to place. So, I am um, originally from Tohachi, New Mexico, which is on the eastern part of the Navajo Nation. Um, I actually reside currently in Flagstaff, Arizona, under the San Francisco Peaks, which is our western boundary mountains of the Navajo people. I am of the Minnehogan people clan, which is my mother. We're a matrilineal society, and my father's clans are from his mother, which is the Salt people clan. And my paternal, my maternal grandfather is of the Weaver people, and my paternal grandfathers are the Red House people clan. And in this way, I identify myself several generations back um, through our female um, lineage back home. So um, I thank you all for letting me speak here. Um, I work for an organization called the Grand Canyon Trust, which is located in Flagstaff. Under the Grand Canyon Trust, we have several programs, and one of the programs that I work under is the Native America program. And under that program, my supervisor and I and several other individuals worked on organizing and orchestrating a conversation initiative, and it's called the Colorado Plateau Intertribal Conversations Group. And under that initiative, we brought back 12 tribes that reside on the Colorado Plateau historically, 
and uh, reestablish relationships amongst each other and reestablish our conversations that once existed historically. And after reservation lines were established, after political boundaries were established and state lines were established, our communications for survival kind of dwindled and our, um, our initiative is to reignite that relationship and reestablish that on the basis of the future of our communities, the future of our tribes, and the future of our children. And so one of the key components, well, there's four key components that we focus on, um, water, our sacred sites, language and culture, and community and individual health. And several years, uh, several year, we've been Going for nine years, um, having these conversations and bringing in tribes, we've had more tribes join our conversations as well as more individuals joining our conversations. And the direction that we, um, our, our direction of approach is to bring in folks that are community driven, that are not political driven, politi politically driven or um, individuals who don't, who are coming for the sake of their community's health and future and their children's health and future. So we have storytellers that are part of our conversations. We have um, excellent professional cornfield planters and harvesters that are part of our conversation. Uh, we have folks who know the songs and the ceremonies for sacred sites that are the only ones left in their tribes. We have these individuals that are part of our conversation moving forward. So we have the um, Hopi tribe, the Navajo Nation, the Wallapai, the Havasupai, the Paiute tribe, the White Mountain Apache, the, Ute, Ute, the Northern Utes, the Southern Utes, the Ute Mountain Utes. Um, we also have the Zuni tribe, the Pueblo of Zuni that are part of our conversations and the Acoma Pueblo. So we're um, quite diverse in our conversations and in our culture but very similar in our teachings and our practices and our way of life and our future planning. So that what makes our conversations very uh, unique and successful. So there, are, I was sitting back there listening to some of the discussions and there's been uh, co continuous converse, or continuous um, t discussions about indigenous perspectives. And um, it makes me actually really excited and, and uh, happy to hear that the indigenous representation is being um, part of the foundational conversations for the rights of nature. And it makes me happy to hear the common themes that are being discussed today um, because it lines up very linear with how we as tribal people see ourselves with um, here on earth as earth surface people. And I'm going to take a few seconds to kind of talk about how we see ourselves um, as indigenous people, as part of the ecosystem, not an in, not as an entity or a life that is a separate from the ecosystem that we live in. And this may give a little bit more context to what uh, some of the key speakers have spoken about today. Um, and it, it, I'm going to go a little bit more in depth just so that we can have a little more understanding. If you have questions about those relationships, then you, you feel free to ask me questions. This is going to be, I'm providing a safe space for you to ask questions because I think one of the big, big components to me coming out and giving um, presentations and speaking is to educate more because we're so isolated in where we're at and we have such a fast moving lifestyle that it's hard to get educated on a lot of things. And this is one of the um, things I think that with throughout the country, should be educated on. Um, when I was in grade school, when we were talking about Native Americans, it was called social studies, and it was four pages in my social studies book that was that thick, and I was living and going to school on the Navajo Nation. So the amount of education that I got from tribes in Native America was probably just the same amount as you have um, when you were in school. So... Um, as Navajo people, we see ourselves as children of the earth. We see the earth as our mother because it sustains our life. We see the sky as our father because it provides us guidance. The stars, the systems, the, er the, the way the sun and the moon move throughout the seasons guides us in our lifestyle and guides our movements and guides our relationship on earth so as a guidance, that's our father. So where the earth and the sun meet, it's the surface. And that's where we are children of these two entities. 
and that goes beyond kind of a little bit more in depth. And when we as Navajo people pray and talk about the future, we pray as an entity of the ecosystem that we live in, the Southwest, the Four Corners area uh, of the states. We see ourselves as equal individuals as the ants. We see ourselves as equal individuals as the wind. We see ourselves as equal individuals as the wildlife, the birds, and the sunlight. And for us, our holy deities are not 100% individual human being images. Our holy people we see as the rainbow, as the sunlight shining in, as the fog, as the breeze that comforts you. Those are our holy deities because it gives us spatial relationships with our ecosystem and our landscape. And for that, we understand our place. The, the air that we breathe in is just as equal as the air that the animals breathe in and the birds breathe in. So because of that, we are of that same stature and equal statutes. So when we talk about, when we talk about um, our place as people, we also understand our relationship. There was, a, there was a presenter this morning that talked about each, as talked about how tribes see themselves, individuals in a relationship with the ecosystem. And the Navajo way of life, it's exactly the same. We see relationships with our landscape, like I said, the father and the, our mother. We also see relationships with uh, insects and with wildlife. So we call them brothers and sisters, um, which Hollywood kind of ruined from us because we don't really talk to animals, but we communicate with them in a spiritual relationship like this. And because of that, it gives us responsibilities to be able to understand their place and our place in, in life. So when we talk about the rights of nature, there was a lot of terminology that was uh, thrown around this morning. I want to make clear that from our perspective as indigenous people, and I think going forward, we have to understand that we're not giving rights to anybody or to nature, nor are we granting the rights of nature to nature. We are, nearly, we are just recognizing the properties of livelihood of, the, of nature for itself and for us as human beings part of that system. And there's one, ter one direction that I want to really emphasize uh, for us is that in the society we live in, as humankind, as, as, as humankind we see ourselves eliminated from landscape or ecosystems, and we see ecosystems and landscapes separate. That's kind of along the same lines of how we look at national parks. The national park system is putting over there and we are over here as viewers rather than us being engaged and having a relationship with that landscape and ecosystem. Because of that disconnect, we don't understand the responsibilities that we have to provide that relationship and continuing that relationship. I think that's one direction that um, is foundational work for the rights of nature. And so um, right now, I want to just conclude with um, where we are moving um, with our uh, Colorado Plateau Intertribal Conversations Initiative on the Rights of Nature. So as these tribes we've gathered, um, we are moving toward recognizing how do we define what this, the rights of nature concept, what it will look like and how it will be defined within our own tribal um, context. How will we move this movement outside of our reservation boundaries? How do we look at each tribal um, position? Because some tribes on the plateau are under treaties with the United States still. Some tribes are under const constitutions within the United States. So we are dissecting pieces of how, the, how this concept will move forward within our, um, within our region. And uh, one of the big things is that it's very hard to find an initiative that tribes 
will become an intertribal coalition on. And this is one that these 12 tribes are really moving in. It's something that's monumental in our region and monumental um, in environmental movement. One of the things that I want, one of the last things I want to say is when we look at this concept of the rights of nature, may not take on the form of that just how they did in New Zealand. It may be under a different concept, but it's still following the same theme is that when we think about their, um, this, this movement, it's, it's, um, it's not so much about protection. The protection and the environmental component of this is only an aspect of this rights of nature theme. And that's one of the things that we are really um, moving and, and educating our communities about. So that's how the, the progression is uh, happening in the Southwest and with the tribes. And um, it's it, the reason why we gravitated, so mu gravitated toward it so much was because the rights of nature concept is very linear with how indigenous knowledge and how our system operates. And so we can relate to the movement of it, um, not just as a tool for protection, but as a tool for changing the mindset of how we look at ourselves with our relationship with the environment. So that's um, just what I wanted to share with you all this afternoon. And thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. So um, we have some time for questions. Um, and as Deanne said, this is a safe space to, to think out loud, share some new ideas. If this changes your perspective, please engage with us. Here you go. You've got a microphone right here. Okay. Um, I guess my question is, I've heard from a number of indigenous, members of indigenous groups that have expressed concern um, from different countries that the codification of the concept of rights of nature, so I'm talking not just about the principles, or the, but rather as it might be codified in Western law, might at times come into conflict with indigenous rights. And so my, my question is your thoughts on the degree to which rights of nature as typically codified, as it may be codified in Western law, may be complementary to or conflict with indigenous rights. Yeah, I can start. You want to take a stab at that? Um, it's absolutely, you're absolutely correct. There are some parallels and some, conf some conflicting factors of it. And I think that in each case would be um, some may be minimal, some may be extreme. One of the other components, so you're, you're right, there are, especially where we live in the Southwest, there's gonna be a lot of conflicting factors because of the number of tribes that are out there, as well as how much tribes want to share. Some tribes are very small and are very protective of their traditional knowledge, so they won't give out a lot of information, but they'll, it, it's gonna be very hard to see how we're gonna utilize that. And one of, one of the other components to your question is another, another factor to, that we can, we've considered is that when we do utilize our traditional ecological knowledge or our traditional knowledge from different tribes, how will that be protected and how will that be utilized in the manner for which it's gonna be utilized rather than misused? Because there is a new age community out there that have taken on the concepts of, of indigenous knowledge and, and misrepresented it. And there's misrepresentation of who we are as indigenous people out there. So given that much more information, what, how will that be protected? So there is gonna be um, a lot of that minimal and um, extreme conflict that's happening, but um, what better time to take it on now than now? Yeah, I guess, I mean, you know, the example that I mentioned with the caribou is a classic example of this, the whale hunt happening, uh, you know, in the Pacific coast as well. And I think probably it, uh, you know, it depends on how you define the rights of nature. And if you see it as absolutely protecting a species, uh, you know, conventionally we've thought about conservation as purging an environment of human activity, human economic activity, right? So, you, whereas an indigenous concept would be much more, well, it's, we, we conserve it, but we use it, and it's we live within the ecosystem. So, um, I, you know, of course, there's a, a question, say, in the caribou hunt, like, are your methods of using, 
you know, going to put the resource at risk, and presumably Indigenous peoples don't want that either. So then it becomes a question of, well, how do you, how do you measure, how do you, what kind of knowledge are you using as the baseline for determining when a resource is at risk or what is sustainable and, and things like that? And we get to the question of, like, then who, who owns knowledge? And it probably comes down to kind of a question of, of governance and management, like who gets to make decisions about things and how you develop a structure that can draw on reliable sources of information, whether it's scientific or traditional knowledge and, and so on. Um, following up on Craig's question about codification of the rights of nature, that reminded me that there's been a lot of discussion about the idea of taking rights of nature, which is inherently thinking about relationships and duties and responsibilities and much more systemic way of thinking, but then layering it on to a Western legal system that's inherently reductionist um, and sort of divides up how we act and react um, as opposed to, you know, uh, you know, maybe customary law or other ways of thinking. Um, do you have any, I know this is, this is a big question, I don't know what the answer is, which is why well, I hope you know. Is there, a, is there a way of thinking about mm -hmm. the structure of the law as opposed to just the substance of the law and in moving forward? I think uh, as a nation, I think we're, we're a long ways from developing a, a, a direction for that, but I know that in, in within, my, within my own nation's government, uh, the Navajo Nation's government, we do have a, a, a Western law structure, but we also have a Navajo law structure called the fundamental law, and there's components and concepts that are within our own language and our own concept that outlines, outlines our relationship with the environment. Um, and our ecosystem, so that kind of structure exists within our nation, and it, it's it's recognized, and that's what builds our sovereignty as a nation. So, having that type of framework already established within our nation is something that um, puts us one step ahead. But I'll, it it doesn't conflict with the Western law direction. It it actually works in parallel with it, and I think that. There may be other nations like that within the United States that have that kind of, so it could be the foundational work for where we would be moving toward as a whole nation. Um, but I think that we're in a society where we don't have, we don't have the luxury to pick and choose which one. I think we're in a society now where we would have to blend the two um, in order to make it, because of the situation that we're in now. So that's, that's my response. Yeah, I mean, this has been raised earlier, the problem with rights that they belong to a kind of modernist, enlightenment, individualistic mindset where they're also um, uh, oppositional. So my right is always, you know, against someone else. And, and, and you know, there's a shift. If you look at the shift in the language and the way Western legal orders use the word rights, it used to be objective rights, so the right thing to do. And then at some point it got trans transformed into subjective rights, like my, so against, against someone. Um, so that's the big problem, but of course we all learn that rights are correlative to duties, and we were just talking before about well, why is it that rights of nature, it's just such a ready rhetoric, and I guess people fight for their rights, you know, it's just, it fits into the way we think about taking action, whereas, uh, you know, framing it as responsibilities is a little more. <laughs> yeah. um, so, you know, I think one of, the, one of the approaches I take in learning Indigenous principles or you know, practices as, as an outsider is that it always makes me reflect back on my own traditions and ways of thinking. And of course, the modern legal system as it is, is it's changing all the time and it hasn't been the way it is for that long, relatively speaking. And if you trace back property rights beyond Blackstone and, and keep going and look at, well, yeah, responsibilities are a huge part of the feudal system. Localized land law was a blend of of property rights and environmental law and the, the, the sort of carrying capacity of the land too. So I think, you know, we can do more to like dig under the surface of the history of, of um, you know, white rights and, and so on in, and, and property and, and everything in, in, in European law as well. Any other questions? Uh, yeah. Hi, my name is Andrew. Um, thank you so much for coming out and talking to us. That was a great talk. Um, so I was just, maybe I'm I hoping to get a little bit of clarification just in terms of native peoples uh, or indigenous peoples way of, way of thinking about um, uh, nature and their rights and stuff like that. And I was thinking, um, so it sounds like what, what has been sort of presented is like, uh, at least in the introduction, is that the rights of nature have to do with like their existence and the shape in which the, uh, nature will take, like the rights of rivers to flow and the rights of forests to exist. But I think that from, from what I've heard from uh, this panel has been sort of the, um, native people's understanding of the rights of nature really have to do with more including them in the discussion instead of 
giving them uh, an exacting shape to take. And, and, and am I right in thinking that, that like maybe the rights of nature in, in this sense is that, um, that the right of nature to be included in a discussion of uh, and taken consideration of it? Yeah, from what I've learned from my indigenous um, collaborators, uh, the, the idea of thinking about, I mean, I mentioned this sort of hunting as a social relationship that's taken quite literally and, and animals and, and the rest of the environment as literally persons who can participate in, for example, treaties. They, t they say that, that um, human treaties were modeled on earlier treaties that human, humans had with the natural environment. And this comes from a history of learning about the patterns in, in which, through which an ecology works. So it's not about kind of defining something in a particular way, it's about learning from a, from a, a longer history in which you do participate in, you know, rivers speak to you, but not with a, you know, not with a, this voice, but they speak, they speak. And, and you learn to listen, we can listen to them through science, but we can listen to them through other ways as well, and spirits, uh, it's a little, I don't have time to unpack how that, how that can be understood rationally, but um, yeah, I think, I think that would be a, a definite shift in perspective that, not, and, and not just participants in a kind of contemporary political compact, which is important, but knowing, understanding the history that has come before that, that shape particular understandings of rights and responsibilities. I would also respond in saying it's a, it's a mixture of, it, it's both. It's both let, knowing, recognizing the rights for rivers, recognizing the livelihood for rivers to flow, mountains to stand, trees to stand, in, in insects and birds to fly. It's that recognition as well as the recognition of ourselves as humans being a factor in that not the lives that we live now because we are we are we're keeping ourselves out of that ecosystem but instead of viewing it back and how we are part of that it, it would be a combination it's a combination of both and once we find that relationship reestablish that relationship back then we will understand the our place in the ecosystem and that 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 the rights of of both are of that equal, so it, it's a it's a combination of, of both. Mm -hmm. I'm developing um, a legal framework that I'm using Earth law to describe. What do you think about the concept of indigeneity um, as as a brick in the building um, foundation? Uh, and considering that we are all Earthlings and we're <coughs> indigenous. We are all indigenous. Do you see any opportunity to advance the platform that way? How many bricks are you going to be using as a foundation? Many, <laughs> as many as we can find. Obviously, the bigger the foundation, the better the structure. But I mean, we, we are, we all probably have roots in some indigenous people somewhere that could be tracked. And so we are all indigenous to. Some, some of us have just forgotten. Absolutely. I think that y you're absolutely right that each of us, from wherever we come from, we're indigenous to that ecosystem, to that place. And I think that it, I, don't, I don't really, um, f I'm not really fond of the concept of indigeneity because I think it's more of humankind. In, in general, and humankind's relationship with the environment, and it doesn't have to be an indigeneity label. And I think that that is the foundational work that you're talking about, that foundational brick that you're referring to in the foundations. We have an, maybe a final question here. Uh, so as a part of uh, any legal structure uh, with duties and obligations, there's the, the damages, the, the so what clause, and, and who cares? and and what's the, what's the, what happens if you break the law? And I was wondering if there was um, some sort of indigenous or Native American or Navajo um, kind of background or uh, philosophy on, on penance and, uh, and the concept of damages. Yeah, we absolutely, be, it, everything, um, it, th this is a, uh, this is talking about the conclusions um, as we began our, the, when um, Kirsten. Kirsten was talking about concluding things, the reason why we don't have 
conclusions in our world is because systems keep continuing. And so as part of that continuation is if we don't um, uphold our responsibilities as man, as humankind, in our society as Navajo people, there are consequences to those mishaps or those um, irresponsible actions. And they're usually leads to death. Um, and that death is not the end. It's a recycling. You're putting yourself back into the, the environment, back into your into the mother and going back. So, for instance, there is, um, we do have um, a term called uh, bat. It's a Navajo word meaning um, there's caution or there's um, awareness that needs to be understood of things and places. And if you um, try to um, gamble with that concept, if you try to gamble with bat, then there will be consequences with that. And into each component, standing at the edge of a canyon, there's that teaching because the wind can push can, people can push you off. There's that about eating certain things, about moving in certain ways, about uh, damaging the vegetation, about contaminating a river, and and things like that. Each element of life has that component in there. So there are principles like that too. Um, to restrictions and man kind of it's kind of like a, a policy or management that we follow um, internally in our own society. Mm. So, so can, can I just make a brief yes, comment? Yeah. So I, I mean, I can think of a range of different examples where there are sanctions imposed by humans. Uh, you know, if I think across Canada, pe banishment, people get put to death, they get get fined, they have to pay co you know co compensation and so on for disrespecting property rights for disrespecting, um, you know, the fish or whatever. Um, but there are also, there's also the idea that the earth will exact s some kind of sanction. So there's yeah. a story, there was a story that was told in the Dogamuk case of some people who were dancing with fish bones on their head and that was disrespectful to the fish. And then there was this big uh, s giant um, mythical bear that came down, I mean, the Geologists tell us it was a landslide, but you know it was a bear that came down and destroyed the village. So, and you know I think the Earth jurisprudence people are telling us now that you know the Earth is this is this is the key moment of the Anthropocene, right? This is, the Earth is responding to human activities, and it's there's a kind of sanction or, or punishment or consequences associated with that too. That so it's not just humans that exact punishment. Mm -hmm. uh, on the other hand, you know law, law is not just about resolving disputes and exacting punishment. It's also about constructing something. There's the negative side, but there's also the positive side of con constructing a, a, you know, something positive. So with that, um, please join me in thanking our panelists. <laughs> and I, I'll turn it over to Margaret to tell us about lunch. <laughs>